have your Bibles, if you would turn with me. We're going to continue in our study in Matthew chapter 5. Today we're in Matthew chapter 5. We're going to start reading here in verse 31. If you don't have your Bibles with you, feel free to grab the one in the chair in front. In front of you, that's yours to use. That's yours to keep if you desire. Today we are continuing our series within a series. We've been going through the Gospel of Matthew. Now we find ourselves inside of the Sermon on the Mount. And specifically this morning... We find ourselves here near the end of Matthew chapter 5. We're going to deal with two more of these last six sections of Matthew chapter 5. Inside of your Bibles, you probably have section headings. There are six of them right at the end of this chapter. And all of them have a very familiar pattern to them. Jesus begins this part of the teaching by saying, You have heard it said that. And then he will refer to some of the teaching that the people had grown comfortable with. And then he's going to say, but then I have this to say to you. So Jesus, in these sections, he refers to what the people have been commonly taught, what they have commonly understood about those teachings. And then what Jesus does is he digs further into the human heart and starts to talk about those inner workings, what Jesus has to say about it. We are discovering that the people that Jesus is talking to are very accustomed to a a surface-styled legalism. If you obey a certain set of rules on the outside, then that makes you the right kind of individual. That's what they are accustomed to. And so Jesus slips past those teachings, and he digs into the human soul, something that I think if we're careful with these passages, we find with these sections of Scripture that sometimes it hits us in uncomfortable ways. These passages of Scripture, in fact, grow incredibly practical to us if we allow Jesus' words to have their work within us. There is a way to hear what Jesus says and to not digest it, not take it in, and not allow our characters and our lives to be changed. But this morning, we want to hear what Jesus says so that his words can slip past us and like taking a piece of bread in our hand and eating it as it digests and becomes a part of it, then it begins to make a difference. Friends, in the kingdom of God, we're going to discover that the human heart can be turned into something that can naturally follow God's laws. These aren't a set of things that Jesus sets up, a new set of legalisms that he is forcing upon us in condemnation and guilt. Instead of that, this is the work of the inner transformation of the words of Christ, the kingdom of God, the presence of the Holy Spirit, so that our lives become the kinds of things that can naturally and easily and even joyfully follow the law of God. So this morning in our passage, the two sections that we deal with, first of all, we get to talk a little bit about marriage and divorce. Now it turns out that Jesus' culture was this crazy mixture of legalism and liberality about marriage and how that worked, and that led to all kinds of problems. And in order to solve those problems, now remember these six sections deal with how you've been normally taught, the way the human heart normally works, and then we have what we are calling the kingdom solution to these issues. The solution in the kingdom of God to what Jesus deals with with marriage is that the kingdom of God reminds us of God's design and intent and purpose for marriage and what that is like. So we get to talk about marriage and divorce, and we actually get to talk this morning also about talking. Sounds like fun. We get to talk about oath-taking, truth-telling, and the way that we relate to other human beings through truth and through the lies that we tell. To solve what had become a convoluted system of layers of lying inside of Jesus' culture, The kingdom of God simplifies our speech and dignifies the individual human being. So let's begin reading in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 31. It was also said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. 
But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. Let's just go ahead and skip all of that and move on to the easier stuff to deal with. How's that sound? Nah. Given the kind things that were said about me this morning, I can't do that now. <laughs> Jesus begins with a common teaching. It has also been taught to you that whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. So if you engage in a divorce, and in this culture specifically the husband, the male, engages in divorce, um, what they had been taught was you must be sure to give her a piece of paper, a writing, a certificate of divorce that made it legal and made it final. What Jesus cites here is not Old Testament scripture. There are some Old Testament scriptures in Deuteronomy about how the certificate of divorce works, but he doesn't cite Old Testament law and scripture. What he cites is what had become semi-legal teaching among the scribes and the Pharisees. This had just become common understanding among them about how divorce should work. This certificate, this piece of paper that a husband wrote was designed to legally finalize divorce. And as far as the scribes and the Pharisees were concerned, that was all that the husband needed to do. So inside of their culture, that certificate of divorce legally finalized the marriage. It was the legal, legally right thing to do. But in their culture, it was also the only morally right thing to do. Because the husband had done this, as long as he writes that piece of paper and signs it, then that's all that is needed to divorce his wife. Now, friends, every time we deal with an issue like this, when we talk about marriage and divorce and family, we as the church, we must recognize all of the seasons of life and the situations that sit inside of the pews of the kingdom of God. And we need to understand a couple of things as we begin to walk through what Jesus is actually saying in this passage. First of all, we will not here speak condemnation because that's not what Jesus is doing in this passage. In fact, he is aggravated with the way his culture had taken and manipulated divorce and the consequences that had come because of that. So in fact, it's the opposite of condemnation that Jesus is speaking here, so we're not going to speak condemnation. Conviction is always a matter between us and the Holy Spirit, but none of this, friends, is condemnation for anything. And we also need to understand this, that in Jesus Christ, there is always hope no matter the past or the present. Sometimes that hope seems so far away and seems so dim, and yet nonetheless, in Jesus Christ, there is always hope no matter the past or the present. In Jesus Christ, there is always forgiveness and healing, and even by His grace, there is even reconciliation that is made possible. We have to understand those things, friends. As we begin to talk about what Jesus says. Having said all of that, let's listen to what Jesus says. It turns out that by all appearances, everything that we can put together about how Jesus' culture actually worked, by all appearances, divorce was actually pretty common and it was relatively easy. Now, we may not sort of think that as we look back on Jesus' culture and we think of a rather strict God-fearing Jewish society, but when we put together the things that were taught, the things that were done, the things that were allowed, it really appears that Jesus lived in a world where divorce was both common and easy to do. So inside of Jesus' world, inside of that teaching that those people were accustomed to, we should ask a question, what justified divorce? In Jesus' day and age, there were two prominent rabbis who taught two different schools of thought about how divorce worked. The first was a rabbi by the name of Shammai, and he taught a rather narrow version of justification for divorce. And he taught that the only good reason for divorce was moral indecency, some form of sexual immorality one way or another. But his point of view was that it's really quite narrow. You can't just divorce your wife for any reason whatsoever. You have to have a rather strict set of things that would justify this. Now, that's one school of thought. The other school of thought that was prominent in Jesus' day was by a rabbi by the name of Hillel. 
And Hillel taught that <clears throat> a man could divorce his wife for nearly any reason whatsoever. So where Shimei taught this rather narrow set of reasons, Hillel taught this rather broad set of reasons. And this sounds like a joke, but it's not. If a wife spoiled the dinner for her husband, the husband could divorce her. If the husband saw somebody that he thought was prettier than his wife, his wife, he could divorce his wife. Now, this is the kind of scribal cultural power that a husband had inside of a marriage in Jesus' day and age. Now, the wife did have recourse. If her husband was engaging in sexual immorality, but her bar was much, much higher than anybody else's. She had to gather a set of witnesses and all kinds of evidence, and she had appealed to the tribes, to the, uh, the tribe's elders and leaders, the, the legal leaders of her tribe, and convince them to convince her husband to write her a certificate of divorce. And because it was very hard for her to do, a wife actively divorcing her husband was incredibly rare. Now, on top of that, who do you think, who, whose school of thought do you think won the day in divorce? Was it it's narrow and difficult, or it's as easy as spoiling dinner and burning the toast? In Jesus' day and age, the broad interpretation, the easy path of divorce is what was common. So in Jesus' day and age, he lives in what we would call today maybe a culture of divorce. So again, as we listen to what Jesus says, we have to listen to how his original hearers would understand what he was saying, the culture that they lived in. So if a husband divorced his wife, what happened to a divorced woman? Their culture, of course, incredibly different from ours. Her opportunities in life were always attached to her family and to her husband. And if she got older and her husband had passed away, it was still attached to her sons. So that was her life. That was her provision. That is how she moved from situation to situation inside of their economy, always attached to her husband, her father, and maybe her eldest son if he could work. So here are the three things that would most likely happen to a woman who got divorced in Jesus' day. First of all, if she was lucky, it is possible that a well-to-do relative would be able to build another room on the side of his house and bring her into his home. But by practice, it made her a second-class citizen inside of that house because she had been divorced by her husband. And more often than not, she lives the rest of her life as a glorified house servant. So that was possible. It is also possible that, that she might get remarried. But again, inside of that culture, she's viewed as soiled goods. She's viewed as a second-class citizen. And more often than not, that's how the husband would view this brand-new wife who had been divorced in the past. The third option that was open to her is that then she could maybe make a living as a prostitute. So in that context, Jesus says... But I say to you that everyone who divorces his wife, except on the ground of sexual immorality, makes her commit adultery, and whoever marries a divorced woman commits adultery. These are not new legalisms or strings of condemnation that Jesus lays on individuals who were divorced and remarried. He is describing what happens in his culture. He's describing what that kind of brokenness causes. He says these things because they were the practical outcomes in his world. It was her new husband's perception of her, or it was her job options. Now, these are awful outcomes, but these are also common outcomes in Jesus' day. So Jesus, in fact, has to say something about how this is broken and how people are being brutalized by this that is so common and so easy inside of his world. And when we take what Jesus says, both in the Sermon on the Mount and in the rest of the Gospels, what Jesus has to say is that he begins to talk about and emphasize the sanctity and the power of a committed, godly marriage. Now, as Jesus does this, 
Does Jesus forbid divorce? He does not. He says here, even in this passage, maybe even except on the grounds of sexual immorality, the word that Jesus uses here is a word in the Greek that broadly speaks of sexual misbehavior um, inside of a marriage and so on and so forth. And so we understand even through Jesus' teachings that sometimes divorce simply becomes the option that a couple takes. But friends, in the end, Jesus wants us to know that we have just taken marriage too lightly. It was too easy, it was too common, it was far too one-sided, and it was causing too much damage. It was believed in his world that what was legally allowable was morally right. Jesus comes to tell us that Legality is not the same as morality. It was believed that if I just write this piece of paper, not only am I right legally on the social level, but I actually stand right before God because for Pete's sake, I wrote that piece of paper. But that doesn't make it right in God's eyes as Jesus speaks about the importance and the power and the sanctity of a God-honoring marriage. So friends, the kingdom solution, as Jesus speaks in the Sermon on the Mount and through the rest of the gospel, the kingdom solution is to see marriage and family through God's eyes. First of all, marriage is a sacred and public commitment made before friends and family and before God. Why do we go to the effort that we do when we get married, when our kids get married, when our friends get married. It's a beautiful occasion. It's a joyous occasion. We want to be engaged with something like that, but then we gather publicly, and I will tell this to young couples that I counsel. I'll even often throw it inside of the vows of the wedding ceremony. You guys stand here not just before each other making this public commitment, but you're making this public vow and commitment before your friends and family. They are your witnesses now to what you have said to each other, and then even beyond that, God is here, and God is attentive, and you are making these vows before yourself and God as well. So it's a sacred, and it's a public commitment made before others and made under the eyes of God. Scripture is clear, friends, that God's design is heterosexual, monogamous, and lifelong. This is what God intends for marriage and for the family. We all understand that so many people are the victims of other people's unrepentant sin. But we're speaking of what God has to say about marriage and what it is and what it does. So this is God's design for marriage and the family. We also should understand this, that God's design for marriage and the family protects all the members of that marriage and of that family. If you can imagine in Jesus' day and age, if they had been doing what God had wanted them to do with their marriages and their families, he wouldn't have had to say what he said about divorce and adultery. God's design protects the members of that family. It protects the members of that family socially. It protects the members of that family economically. And it protects the members of that family even psychologically and physically. It is what God intends, and it is something that can be powerful and beautiful. And then, friends, on top of that, God's design for marriage and family is actually what is best for everybody else. This is interesting. It is what is best for society. Society will flourish best when God's design for marriage and family is being lived out among his people. Some of you have heard me tell this story. I've told it a couple times. It impacted me so much. So if you've heard this, I need you to nod your head knowingly as if I really am a wise individual and say, yes, that is absolutely right. A lot of you know that a few years ago I was involved with, this church was involved with, there's still several people in the church who are still actually on the board of Sarah's home. We had helped get uh, Sarah's home started, and 
Sarah's Home is an organization that provides long-term ministry and care and education to girls who are pulled out of human trafficking here in the state of Colorado. And there are really just some incredible things that have happened and possibilities through Sarah's Home. Our missionary guest next month is their new director of Sarah's Home, Vicki Prophet. So I look forward to hearing from her as well. You're going to get a kick out of Vicki, so you're going to want to come be a part of that. But getting that started meant that we were involved in conversations with various departments of social services and legal departments and foster agencies and on and on and on. And so a few of them were getting to know me and some of the others uh, involved with Sarah's home. I was invited to a roundtable organization of roughly a dozen of these social service agencies. They were talking about opening up a regional office on one part of town and so on and so forth. So they invited us to come and sit and talk about Sarah's home. And it was really interesting because this was a round table of maybe a dozen people um, incredibly committed to what they did, magnificent people who loved kids and who loved families. And around that table was represented the Pikes Peak Library District, district feeding programs, foster agencies, uh, the United Way, organizations that took care of kids that were pre-K, organizations that took care of kids who were kindergartners, organizations that took care of kids when they hit elementary school, organizations that clothed these kids, provided literature and literacy for these kids and an agency that dealt only with children who had significant mental and physical disabilities I mean it was really something what was going on around that table but the more they talked something interesting started to happen and it became their only conversation they began with all of that they began to talk about all the kids that were still slipping through the system everything represented there that And I don't mean this negatively, but our tax dollars pay for because we're creating this net to try to encourage these families and kids as much as we can. And yet they begin to lament the number of kids that fall through the cracks and there's just not enough to take care of them. And something hit me like a lightning bolt. Everything around that table is replaced with a family. Isn't that interesting? Everything around that table is replaced with the family, the food, the clothing, the education, the literacy, the medical help and support. God's design for family, (laughs) it's best for society. It's best for others. And when it falls apart, we as good-hearted people do everything we can to help that but we just can't fill in the role that God's family plays. Isn't that amazing? So friends, as we think about something like this, I want us to think like this for a minute. So here's what I think, at least part of what the church and the Christian need to do. This is part of how the church and the Christian need to approach this issue. First of all, We as the church of Jesus Christ need to learn to show forgiveness and love to every broken condition. It was the scribes and the Pharisees that were allowing families to be broken and judged, not the people who follow Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? We can't be Pharisees and scribes. We must learn the kind of forgiveness and love to every broken condition that Christ shows. The church needs to be the kind of place where every one of us knows that we are broken and are in need of healing and we are on our way to Christ like this. And then, friends, we as the church, we join each other in this journey of growing up to look like Jesus Christ. That's, that's describes the person sitting next to you. That describes me. That describes the people that walk into this building. And we need to learn to walk with each other with this in mind. But then also, friends, we need to learn how to just not bend on God's design for marriage and family. We must refuse to take our brokenness as a reason to redefine God's plan. Does that make sense? We have to refuse to take our own brokenness and even our own sinfulness, refuse to take that as an excuse to redesign what God has actually put together. And friends, I believe 
that the church has a powerful and profound role to play inside of our culture if we are faithful and if we love like Jesus Christ loved. Now we're going to chance, we'll get a chance through the rest of Matthew to touch on marriage and family and these issues, but we need to understand these things. And as we move from one section to the next, next, what we're going to see is that Jesus' world took marriage far too lightly. And it also turns out that Jesus' culture took honesty too lightly. Okay? So, section number one applies to us. Section number two applies to us, especially in the crazy political season. This culture took honesty far too lightly. Let's read this next section, verse 33. Again, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear falsely, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn. But I say to you, do not take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it is the throne of God, or by the earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say simply be yes or no. Anything more than this comes from evil. So you you have heard it said. It's been taught to you. You shall not swear falsely, but you shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn Again, Jesus cites a rather common teaching among his day. This, again, is not an Old Testament law, though there are Old Testament laws that dovetail with with what Jesus says. That's not what he cites here. Again, this is common teaching among the scribes and the Pharisees. And it's a combination of Old Testament laws and, again, their cultural habits. The idea of keeping promises, of being a truth teller, of speaking with integrity, all of these things are common Old Testament teachings. If you read the Proverbs on a regular basis, you hear there often what it means to speak like a wise person and to speak like a fool, right? This notion of integrity in our speech, that our intention and our words are the same thing, is actually a very common Old Testament teaching. However, their cultural and their tribal, or excuse me, their scribal traditions had actually built up a rather complicated system of oath taking. <laughs> and what, what happened with this complicated system of oath taking is that it then created a sliding scale of truth. Isn't this interesting? So here's what, here's what you could do, and this is why Jesus says the things he does in this little section. Here's what you could do. You could swear to someone, you could take an oath that I really am telling you to the truth, and you could swear by something here on earth. You could swear by the Mount of Olives. You could swear even by the hairs on your head. But if you swore by something here on earth, everybody understood that you were mostly bound to do what you said that you would do. And if push came to shove because the things of this earth pass away, your oath really does not mean as much as it maybe it could have meant. It was a sliding scale of truth. However, if you really meant it, you could swear by God in heaven. And because he never changes, then your oath taking was bound by God. And then everybody knew that you had to perform what you said or what you said was actually true. Now, here's what's interesting. None of that protects the truth. In fact, all it does is muddy the truth. It doesn't clarify our speech with other human beings. It confuses our speech with other human beings. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, again in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, he comments on this passage by saying, now remember what Jesus said. He said, but I'm going to tell you, just don't take oaths at all. Don't do any of that. So Bonhoeffer says this, Therefore, the oath must go, since it is a protection for the lie. That human speech like this, we can speak with other human beings. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. (laughs) But we are able to speak with other human beings in such a way that we know that what we are saying and what they are hearing is cloaking the lie. And we can set it up in a system of oaths. 
We can sit before Congress and say, Senator, I have no memory of that. <laughs> we can plead the fifth. We can do whatever it is on an individual basis with our speech, and we know we are manipulating the situation, not in order to clarify the truth, but to hide a lie. So Jesus says, just don't do that. Let your yes be it. Let your no be it. So the kingdom solution to this is integrity of speech. It's very simple. It's integrity of speech and it's lives of truth telling. So creating a system of communication where it can be assumed that you are not telling the truth is not Christ honoring. Does that make sense? If we create a system of communication where it's assumed that I'm probably not telling the truth is just not Christ honoring. So there is the matter of the followers of Jesus Christ, those who truly belong to God, must become truth-tellers. There is that dynamic to it, but then there is also the dynamic of the manipulation of other human beings. This system of communication is an inherently wrong way to actually approach and be in relationship with other human beings. This kind of communication, this kind of oath-taking, is nothing but manipulation of other people to get our way. We play with their emotion, we play with the circumstance, we turn them into tools so that we can do what we want to do anyway. So this complicated system of verbal acrobatics to manipulate a situation turns other people into objects and tools for my own goals. Instead of that, the Christian learns to become the kind of person whose speech honors other people and is reliably truthful. Our speech, the way I approach you, must honor you and who you are. And I must become the kind of person who is reliably truthful in my speech. Proverbs 26, verse 28 puts it pretty bluntly. A lying tongue hates its victims. Isn't that interesting? A lying tongue hates its victims. Maybe as a Christian we can flip that on its head. A tongue that learns how to speak the truth in love dignifies the people that we speak with. So Jesus says very simply, let what you say simply be yes or no in Anything more than that is an open door to these evils that you're so used to. So instead of relying on these verbal acrobatics to let me know you are honest, let me learn to assume that you are just a reliably honest individual, right? Let that be how we speak with each other. Not in manipulation or the hiding of a lie, but rather the revealing of truth and honesty and love. This is not the only place that Scripture speaks of this sort of thing. Jesus' brother James has this to say about it in James chapter 5. But above all, brothers, do not swear either by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Just let this be what your speech is with each other. The Apostle Paul inside of that magnificent passage in Colossians chapter 3, I love the bluntness of this. In Colossians 3, 9, he says this, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. That's what you used to do. That's what you belonged to back then, but all of that is gone. So now you have a new life and new practices. So just don't lie to each other, Paul says, to the disciple of Jesus Christ. So friends, we are people who belong to the truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So let us be people of truth and integrity in our speech and in our relationships as well. Now something struck me as I was going through these passages of Scripture. I mentioned it briefly right at the very top, but these kinds of things, these passages here in, in Matthew chapter 5 are the kinds of things that if we are attentive and we're listening to what's going on, Christ's word is creeping its way into some of the raw nerves inside of our 
souls, the places we tend to keep hidden and blocked up because it hurts when it gets revealed to us. But this is, in fact, the point of what Jesus has to say. Now, you've grown accustomed to making things look right on the outside. I'm going to slide into the workings of the inner human heart, and we're going to start to transform things from the inside out. So we can read this and nod our heads and say, yes, that's absolutely right and that's true. And then we can go about our daily work and our daily business and our relationships and not let any of it have its way with us. See, friends, we're after something here in the Sermon on the Mount as Jesus talks about inner transformation. The kind of heart that is transformed into the image of Jesus Christ so that following his law, living his life, becomes second nature to us, becomes something that we're attracted to, becomes something that we love, becomes something that we desire, and it's not, it's not something that we're hit over the head with all the time, but arises from within us. So we must learn how to hear these things and digest these things. Heather was reading this week something from Charles Spurgeon, if you haven't read any of Spurgeon's works, you should pick them up from time to time, his devotional morning and evening. And Heather happened to be reading this, and so this is what I want to finish with as we listen um, to Spurgeon talk about the difference between truth sitting on the outside of us and truth sitting on the inside of us. Here's what he has to say. Truth must enter into the soul, penetrating and saturating it, or else it is of no value. Doctrine accepted simply as a matter of a system of belief is like bread in one's hand, providing no nourishment to the body whatsoever. But doctrine accepted by the heart is like digested food that through assimilation sustains and builds up the body. We're eating the word of God. It is a natural law. It's normal that the inner parts affect the outer body just as light shines from the center of a lantern through the glass. Therefore, in the same way, when the truth is kindled within us, its brightness shines forth in our outer life and conversation. Walking in truth, therefore, leads to a life of integrity and holiness and faithfulness. Let's listen to what God has to say and allow him to have his way in our lives as our lives begin to be transformed into the image of Jesus Christ. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, again, we are grateful for this time together this morning, all that you have given us, all that we have had the chance to hear and celebrate and worship. And God, our time in your word as well, I ask that you would be at work within us because of the things that you have to say, as you reveal to us life in the kingdom of God, as you reveal to us what normally goes on inside of the broken human heart, as you show to us in your word and the words in the life of Jesus Christ, how the kingdom of God takes all of that brokenness and changes it. So Father, I pray that your voice would be heard this morning. Your spirit would be at work among your church and your people today. So, Heavenly Father, we give ourselves again over to you, to your work, to the power, the forgiveness, and the healing that is possible inside of the kingdom of God. In your magnificent and beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen. I'm going to ask everyone to stand with us. And as we close... You guys know that through the month of October, we have been spending time praying for Living Hope Church. This is the last Sunday in the month of October, and so we're going to do this one more time specifically. We're going to do this as the body of Christ. We're going to do this together. We're going to do this lifting up each other. We're going to do this lifting up God's desire and plan for this church, lifting up those that we are praying for who need to be a part of the church and need to know Jesus Christ. We're going to do this, friends, in obedience to what I believe the Spirit has asked us to do for this particular month. So when we begin playing, I am again going to invite all of you to make your way down front. Again, no pressure.
to pray for anyone or to do anything in particular, but just come down front as a sign of solidarity with the family of God as we pray for each other and lift up the church of Jesus Christ. So friends, let's pray and let's sing together. You can go ahead and come forward. Matthew chapter 6, verse 1 is where we're going to start reading here in just a couple of minutes. Now, <clears throat> one of the things that the disciple of Jesus Christ learns in the process of life with Christ is the difference between living for the approval of other people versus living under the gaze of God. Now, one of the things that we are discovering that is sort of coming out inside of the Sermon on the Mount, the way Jesus talks about discipleship, is that we are discovering that there's a certain way of life that comes natural to us. It's normal to us. It's even the kind of way of life, even through their legalism, that the Pharisees and the scribes, that they were teaching to the people. And so Jesus is speaking uh, to human hearts that live this sort of normal, broken human existence and then he begins to talk about what life can be like actually inside of the kingdom of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit. And now we find ourselves in this passage of Scripture, Matthew chapter 6, where Christ is beginning to reveal to us the difference between living for the approval of other people, living under the gaze, the sights, the judgment of other human people, versus living a life that is holy and completely dedicated to the gaze of God alone. Questions like, who sees our deeds? Who sees what we do? What kind of people we want to present ourselves as? Who approves of what we do? And why are the answers to those kinds of questions important for you and me in our walk with Christ? Why are the answers to that question important to what we do with Jesus on a regular basis? The uh, Danish theologian Soren Kierkegaard, and here's your 50-cent word, right, for the day. You can impress your friends. I heard what Kierkegaard said about this once. Uh, but he's a magnificent, uh, magnificent man, wholly dedicated to God. And he said at one point, the worship of the Christian is always done for an audience of one. And I love that phrase. That what we do when we worship, what we do when we walk through our lives, what we do when we pray, what we do when we give, what we do when we read scripture, what we do in our relationships with those around us and that we love, we are doing finally and ultimately for an audience of one. We do it before God, we do it under his eyes, and we do it in ways that are faithful to him. So we discover that in the end, God is the audience. For our lives and God is the audience for our worship that's what we do here when we gather on Sunday mornings we're gathering for the audience of one so that he can be glorified so that this becomes his throne room when we gather isn't that beautiful friends so the beginning of chapter 6 Jesus makes his point and then he uses about the next 18 verses or so of chapter 6 to give us examples of of how this works in the life of the disciples. So now this morning, we get to walk through a couple of those examples. First, we get to talk about this. When you give, don't do it for the acclaim and the attention of others, but find ways to give so that the only important person for you when you give is God and the sight of God. So we don't give for the acclaim of others, even though I patted all of you on the back this morning. <laughs> We're doing it for the sake of God. And then secondly, we get to talk about this. When you pray, don't try to impress others. Learn how to speak with God and forget the attention of other people one way or the other. So these are the things we get to talk about this morning as we listen to the words of Christ. So let's begin reading in Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them, for then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, 
Sound no trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may be praised by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you. So that first verse becomes the principle. It becomes the big idea for most of the rest of what Jesus has to say in the next few verses. Beware of practicing your righteousness, your goodness, your religion, your spirituality, spirituality before other people in order to be seen by them, to be praised by them. Because if that's how you do it, Jesus says, then you've gotten everything that you aimed at. But you haven't actually received what your heavenly Father wants to give. So this becomes the primary issue for the next several verses. This is the principle, and then Jesus begins to walk through examples about how this works inside of the kingdom of God. He says fundamentally right here at the very beginning, do not turn your religion, do not turn your spirituality into a public show so that other people can see how righteous you are. Now, one of the reasons this is an easy thing for Jesus to say in the Sermon on the Mount is the kind of world that these people lived in. Their primary religious leaders, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, they very much lived a life of external righteousness. They wore certain kinds of clothes in certain kinds of ways. They walked in certain kinds, literally, they walked in certain kinds of ways down the street so that when you saw them, you might think, now this person is genuinely righteous and religious. I mean, look at that person. Look at that dress. Look at what they've got on their heads. Look at what they're seeing and how they're behaving. These people have to be righteous because this is what things look like on the outside. So it's very common among the Pharisees. This was their religious lifestyle, and this is actually how they are teaching spirituality and their religion to everyone inside of Jesus' culture. As long as you've got, and we keep on using these kinds of phrases, as long as you have the outside of the cup clean and nice and in order, then everything else is just fine. So Jesus, throughout the Sermon on the Mount, he is critiquing this kind of life that the Pharisees